Our reading today can be found on page 1179 on the Church Bibles. Hear the word of the Lord as it is written in Philippians 2, beginning from verse 1 to 11. Imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something that to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm up here in case you're uh, sort of wondering where I am. <laughs> um, shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and being able to meet together. And we pray that as we look at your word, we would meet Jesus and that you would speak to us by your spirit. Please help us to listen to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Who is the most powerful or famous person you've ever met? Now, when someone tells a story about meeting a famous person, one thing they almost always comment on is how were they in relation to their fame? Were they normal? Were they down to earth? Or were they aloof and highfalutin? Did they treat people differently because of a difference in perceived status? Or did they treat people as though they were the same. Now, so how someone tells the story of meeting someone famous will often be influenced by their preconceived idea of the celebrity that they're meeting. If it's a celebrity they're not so keen on, they might delight in telling you that they were really full of themselves and kept themselves separate from normal people. However, if it's a person that they really like and admire, they will be even more delighted if they can tell you that they were really normal, really down to earth, no high opinion of themselves, but keen to talk to and hear about others. Now, when the person that we meet is opposite to what we might be expecting or hoping for, it can sometimes throw us. Either as we have to grudgingly admit that maybe they are quite a normal and generous person after all, or we have our treasured image of our favorite person shattered as they disappoint us. And we have to sadly nod along as someone says, never meet your heroes. So then, I wonder, what's your impression of God? He is the most famous and powerful person there is. How does he sit with all his fame and status? The majority of you here have met God. How do you speak of him? 
What impression did he give? And for those of you that haven't yet met him, what do you think he would be like? This morning, as we meet God in his word, we are going to see that God is humble. He is relatable. He doesn't consider his fame and his power as a barrier to protect him and remove him from the hoi polloi of humanity. Rather, he sets it aside so that we can know him and have the relationship with him that we were made for. He is quite literally down to earth. So, what a privilege it is to look at Philippians 2 together this morning. And I'm so glad that you are here to look at it with me. We're going to start by looking at verses 6 to 11, as we have this beautiful poem or hymn that Paul includes in his letter to the Philippians. And he's reflecting on Jesus and what Jesus' attitude is. Um, And then the structure of the phrases of the hymn is that Jesus goes down, 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 and then up, up, up. And then we're going to look at um, how we fit into all this as well. So we're going to go down, we're going to go up, and then we're going to see how we fit in. So first of all, let's look at um, Jesus as he chooses to come down. Verse 5 says, and you can read it along with me, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Verse 6 says, Who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. We start with the simple truth that Jesus is God. Being in very nature God. He is of the same substance of God. One and the same. Made of the same stuff. As the great carol that we'll be singing tomorrow morning says, God from God, light from light. And so, as Jesus is God, he has all the status of God, and he is deserving of all the honor, glory, and worship that God is. And yet, he was willing to give up this equality with God. You may be familiar with Um, other translations of this verse, that instead of saying something to be used to his own advantage, say something to be grasped. He didn't hold so tightly, so holding on and gripping to the glory and splendor and majesty that were rightly his, and demand that he must have them. Instead, he was willing to give them up, to let go of them. As verse 7 says, rather, he made himself nothing, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. He makes himself nothing. He becomes a nobody. He leaves behind all the splendor and worship of heaven, and he takes the very nature of a servant, becoming a human, and a human who was born to serve, not to be served. This very nature phrase is the same one that is in verse 6. In the same way that Jesus is one and the same as God, made of the same stuff, that is true of Jesus being a servant. He is a servant made of the very stuff of a servant. It is core to who he is. Now Christmas is such a great time to be looking at this passage because of the nativity story and how well it shows us God's humility even beyond becoming human, which you would think would already be fairly humbling for the God of creation to take on the same substance as his creatures. But beyond that, Jesus is is a humble humanity. He came to serve, and he came in lowly circumstances. I wonder, if you were arranging for the arrival of the great and mighty Lord of all creation, how would you arrange it? A stable? A feeding trough for a bed? Welcomed by shepherds, the roughest and most earthy people of the day? Born into a situation that meant that questions of illegitimacy would stick to the family for life? Becoming a refugee within a couple of years of birth, forced to flee due to persecution. Growing up in a backwater town, which when people hear about it, they say, surely nothing good can come from there. Not the circumstances we would plan at all. So why? 
Why so humble? Well, as we're seeing today, humility is right at the heartbeat of God's love. You can't love like God without humility. You can't self-sacrificially love and serve another without holding what you have lightly. But on top of that, he came like this so that we could relate to him, so that we could know God, and we needed him to be like this. Uh, We couldn't have coped, we couldn't have related to him, to Jesus, if he had arrived with all the glory of heaven. It would have been too much for us. But Jesus' downward journey didn't stop at just living a humble human life. Let's look at verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The final depth of humility is for God, the source of life, to become subject to death. And not just any death, but death on a cross, the most humiliating and excruciating death, displayed as a criminal for all to see and to mock, enduring an agonizing ordeal after having already been beaten and flogged. The most shameful death reserved for the worst offenders taken by God himself. Jesus descends to the lowest possible place, descending all the way from the glory of God to the judgment and punishment of God. And yet, as we ask again why, we see again that it was all for us and all for God's glory. That at the lowest point of his descent, that's where he had to go to pick us up because that's where we were. We were in the position of death and we were deserving of God's judgment and punishment. We had rejected the giver of life, so of course we were stuck in death. But Jesus took that death and punishment for us, all as part of God's plan to restore us to relationship with himself and to remake the world to how it should be. But then what? After coming down, 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 what's next for Jesus? Well, what we see is from this lowest of depths, where Jesus willingly went for our sake and for God's glory, God now raises him up. And that's our second point. Uh, God raises Jesus up. Verse 9 says, Therefore, because of all this, because of this journey down, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Jesus is in the highest place. Is anything higher than the highest? No. When my brother and I were younger, one of us would occasionally say to the other, you're weird. The other would then respond, you're weirder. To which the final reply would be, you're the weirdest. From which there was no comeback. We had reached the superlative insult. There was nothing beyond it. And this is what is said of Jesus. He is in the highest place. There is no place higher. Everything else is beneath him. And he has been given a name that is above every name. Now that's an interesting phrase, that he's been given a name. This is something new that's been added to him as a result of his willingness to humble himself and serve. And we'll come back to this idea in a moment. But for now, just note that this name is above every other name. Now already, this is a big up, but we're going to go up even further. Verse 10 says, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every knee should bow. And just in case we weren't clear, the detail makes it absolutely plain. In heaven, the bits above, on earth, the bits around us, and under the earth, the bits below. There is no more than that possible. Everything is covered, and everything bows the knee. He's not just in the highest place, 
but everyone should acknowledge this and give the right reverence and respect to him for it. Now, it's amazing to note that his human name is still the name being used here. He's still Jesus, who was named by Joseph and Mary after being born in a stable. He's still human, even in this exalted position. And then verse 11, and every tongue acknowledged that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So finally, as we go up, 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 not only is every knee bowing, but every tongue is acknowledging that Jesus, his human name, Christ, meaning anointed one or Messiah, the promised king from the Old Testament, is Lord. The word used here is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word used to represent the covenant name of God in the Old Testament, a name considered so holy that Jews wouldn't say it. And this is the name that Jesus has. And all of this is to the glory of God the Father. It was all his plan. Now, one of the amazing and slightly mind-stretching things that is that this journey down and up shows us is that Jesus ends up in an even more glorious position than when he started from. And God is even more glorified as a result of Jesus' Jesus' humility, service, and obedience. And as we are brought into relationship through this, we are part of that extra glory. The up is so much greater than the down. So this journey has been uh, fittingly described as a J curve. You can see an illustratory J on the screen, so if you want to see what a J looks like. And but with the J, we can see that there is a short journey down. There we go, little arrow. And then there's an even greater journey upwards. A journey down in humility and sacrifice, resulting in a greater journey up into glorifying God and being honored by him. Now, another amazing thing about this upward leg of the journey is that after meeting us and taking our sin at the very bottom of the curve on the cross, Jesus then takes us up with him on the other side. He picks us up at the bottom in all of our mess and sin and shame and death and we are raised with him to life and to glory. And the Bible tells us that that is where we are now spiritually. If you are trusting in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are united with him by the Holy Spirit. You are in him. And so you have been raised and you are with him in the presence of God right now. We participate in this not because of anything we have done or could ever do, but because God delights to bring his lost people home to himself. A quick application before we move to think a little bit more about our part in this. Um, It has all been done. Jesus is Lord right now. He is the one who is reigning over creation, who has united all who trust in him with God. He has forgiven them and given them new life. So if this Christmas you are trusting in Jesus, you have great reason to rejoice. No matter what you're facing, no matter where you might be, the story of God humbly coming into the world to serve us so that we might have life and forgiveness in him is true and is a source of great comfort. We, we may and we will go through difficulties, but in Jesus we are absolutely secure and one day all this trouble will pass, but he will remain and we will remain in him, in the new creation where we will live in God's good and life-giving presence as we were made to. So be encouraged. However, we also need to be aware that Jesus is still Lord and is still reigning even if we are not currently trusting him and if we are rejecting him as Lord of our lives. 
Our rejection of him doesn't change the reality of his reign. And so we also need to be aware that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And there is a choice to make whether to do so willingly, accepting his offer of life, or unwillingly, keeping rejecting him and accepting the consequences for our rebellion against him. There is no better Lord to serve and bow before than the Lord who has already served us and who loves us with a love that went through every obstacle in order to bring us back to the life and love in relationship with God that we were made for. This Christmas is the perfect time to think more about that choice. Let's finish this morning by thinking a little bit more about what our part is. When we have been taken by Jesus from the bottom of the curve to the top, we are now in. We've gone from death to new life in him, and we are now able to live worshipping and glorifying God. We see from the context of this passage that it is our privilege to now be able to live the same way that Jesus did. We are to have the same mindset as we read in verse 5. Now the preceding verses say, um, from verse 2, that we are to be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In other words, this pattern of humble, self-sacrificial love and service is to be our pattern too. And it is a thing of joy to behold. We can rejoice in sharing in God's humility. We are called to serve in the same J-curve fashion, to go low, to not consider ourselves too highly, and certainly not to think that we have any more right to cling on to things than Jesus did. After all, we are creatures who have been given everything we have. He is God who rightly deserves honour and yet left it behind. But it would be wrong to start thinking that I'm saying that we should do this because Jesus did it. Like there's some sort of transaction that's going on. See how much he did for you, now you've got to do all this for him. That's not at all what I'm saying. Rather, not only does Jesus show us what God is truly like, but he also shows us what a true human, untainted by sin, is like. He shows us the best way to live. He shows us life to the full. And life to the full, according to God, is a life of humble, other person-centered, self-sacrificial love. Now there's a reason that the most compelling storylines in literature and film are the ones that involve sacrifice for others. Whether it's Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, uh, Marvel adventure films, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Each of these beloved stories has at its core a compelling story of self-sacrificial love for others, a picture of serving others for their greater good and benefit, even at cost to self. Now, you might like to spend a bit of time later today thinking about how each of these stories um, shows that. But before moving on to a bit of a challenge, let me first say that there are some people here who are already pouring themselves out and are living this self-sacrificial love and really have not got much more that they could possibly give. Three quick things to say to you. One, what you are doing is beautiful and we praise God for it. Two, Know that Jesus is right there with you, by his spirit, giving you the strength, comfort, and energy you need. And he loves to provide for you as you serve him. And three, don't flog yourself to the point that you are unable to serve anymore. It is godly to rest, and it is also godly to be served by others sometimes. But for a lot of us, we are more on the selfish, reluctant side of things. 
And we need to be shown that the, the light of a better way to make us realize that life could be so much more if only we realized it. So let me ask you and myself the direct question. What is it that you are grasping hold of that is preventing you from experiencing the joy of living in God's love, serving others? You may know, and I'm just going to get my prop. You may know the story of how monkeys used to be trapped and caught. Hunters would put some food or a treat for the monkey in a jar or a coconut that had a small opening. Now, I realize this is a jug. That's fine. But the small opening, just big enough for the monkey to get its hand into, but not big enough for the monkey to get its hand out of once it had grasped hold of whatever was inside. So once the hand had gone in to grab whatever treat it was, whatever good thing, and the fist had been formed, the monkey was trapped, and the container would be tethered. And it was the monkey's unwillingness to let go of whatever was inside that would keep it trapped for the hunters to easily collect. The only thing trapping the monkey was its mental desire to keep hold of whatever it was. The same can be true of us. We can so highly prize something and be unwilling to let it go that it traps us. It can be a good thing. But when we hold on to it too tightly and are not willing to let it go to serve others, it is actually trapping and limiting our lives. Is it your reputation? Not wanting to be associated with certain people. Is it that you're convinced that you're right? And you can't possibly accept that someone else might do something in a different way. Is it that you love your money and the lifestyle it provides you with? Is it your time, which you fill with things that distract you, so you couldn't possibly do anything else? Is it your comfort? When confronting whatever it is that you're holding on to and deciding whether to let it go or not, know this, that just as Jesus was raised to a higher place than from where he started his journey down, the same will be true for us. God honors our service of him. He loves to bless us. And as we serve him and trust him, we get to know more of him. We experience more of his love and we get closer and closer to his heart. The J curve applies to us too. As we go lower and lower in our service of others, he just keeps raising us higher and higher. Do you want to know more of the joy of living life in close communion with God? Go low, live humbly, and he will raise you into ever greater knowledge and experience of his love for you. Faith often operates in small steps. And as we see God's faithfulness with each step, we start to take bigger and bigger ones. So the last thing I'll ask you is what is the next step down for you today? At Christmas, we see Jesus humbly come to serve us, to love us, and to restore us. And we have the joy of spreading that love to those around us too as we serve them. Let's be a church that loves like Jesus loves to the benefit of our whole church family and the wider community. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus' humility and we praise you that he was willing to give up everything in order to serve us and bring us into relationship with you. Thank you for the grace you have given us and the opportunity that we have at Christmas to rejoice 
as we remember your great love for us as Jesus enters into his creation. We ask that you would help us to love like you love and to know the joy of serving others. Please help us to see the next step down and give us the faith and courage to take that step. May we be praising you for how we then see you at work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.